I'm Laura London, and this is a special video edition of Speaking of Jung. Returning to us today for episode 129 is Jungian analyst and author, Dr. James Hollis in Washington, DC. He earned a PhD in literature from Drew University and taught humanities and the philosophic traditions of cultures for 26 years before training as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich, where he earned a diploma in analytical psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst in 1982. Dr. Hollis is the co-founder and first director of training of the Philadelphia Jung Institute, worked as a senior training analyst for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, and for many years served as executive director of the C.G. Jung Educational Center in Houston. In 2014, he relocated to Washington, D.C. to work as executive director of the Jung Society of Washington and is now a member of their board of directors. He is also vice president emeritus of the Philemon Foundation, a group of scholars, board members, and donors who share the mandate to prepare the unpublished works of C.G. Jung. Dr. Hollis continues to write and to lecture both nationally and internationally. He is now the author of 19 books, many of them bestsellers. They are in order, Harold Pinter, The Middle Passage, Under Saturn's Shadow, Tracking the Gods, Swamplands of the Soul, The Eden Project, The Archetypal Imagination, Creating a Life, On This Journey We Call Our Life, Mythologems, Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life, Why Good People Do Bad Things, What Matters Most, Hauntings, Living and Examine Life, Living Between Worlds, Prisms, The Broken Mirror, and his latest, A Life of Meaning, Relocating Your Center of Spiritual Gravity, published in July by Sounds True. He has joined us on six previous episodes of Speaking of Young, including last year's celebratory 100th episode. Please visit the special James Hollis page on our website for a comprehensive look at his work, including links to his previous episodes, his books, audiobooks, films, print interviews, lecture schedule, and a series of online video courses through the Jung Society of Washington and Soul at Play that you can start anytime, work at your own pace, and enjoy lifetime access to the material. Today's episode is made possible by Temenos Dream, the revolutionary new dream recording app available for iOS and Android. Having trouble remembering your dreams? Now you can record them as soon as you wake up by speaking into your phone or typing them into the app. Keep your dreams organized, search the built-in symbol dictionary, and have AI illustrate your dreams all within the app. Download it and create a free account today by clicking on the link in the description box below or on our website, speakingofyoung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This video interview is being recorded on Monday, November 20th, 2023, through the magic of StreamYard. Hi, Dr. Hollis. Good morning. Pleasure thank, to be with you, Laura. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's really great to see you again. Good to be with you. So we are here to discuss a new book uh, that was released this summer. And it's actually, it, it's sort of an accompaniment to an audio book that you recorded back in 2019. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yes. So this book is titled A Life of Meaning, Relocating Your Center of Spiritual Gravity. And the audio book is titled A Life of Meaning, Exploring Our Deepest Questions and Motivations. So would you tell us how this book came to be? Well, frankly, I was invited to give a series of lectures, so I just reached into my grab bag, and <laughs> these are the lectures that came out, and uh, um, they were recorded in the Boulder, Colorado area a, a couple of years ago, and someone said, you know, I'd like to be able to have a text where I could write notes to myself and underline, so that's how this book happened. Mm -hmm. It is eight chapters, and some of the themes are themes that you know, you've written about before, but you write about them in a different way. And they touched me 
very deeply. I, this, I always say this about every book of yours. This is your greatest book. This is your greatest book. Uh, you cover everything. And these are themes that need to be repeated and definitely bear repeating. And I'd like to start at the beginning. Uh, chapter one is titled Discerning the Formative Influences of the Early Days. And right there on page one, you say the path of personal growth and development is not found so much in finding the answers because the answers we do find at best serve only for a, for a little while or are someone else's answers. And that really struck me is that we're all looking for answers, but what are we finding? We're finding other people's answers and we need to find our own, right? Certainly. Well, you know, one of the uh, legacies of being a child, tiny, vulnerable, dependent, is we, we tend to uh, disown our own personal authority and respond to whatever the pressures are in the environment. And that's, that's understandable. But as a result of which, we, we have a tendency to assume that what's coming to us in the outer world has a, a greater influence and a greater uh, legitimacy, perhaps, than we do. So, you know, we, one could say, and this is an overgeneralization, the first half of life is trying to figure out what the world wants of me and trying to meet their expectations, whether it's family of origin or the school teacher or the employer or whomever. Um, and the second half of life is trying to figure out, you know, w what is true for me and how do I find that and how do I find the courage to live that? And so uh, the second half of life is really a recovery effort of, mm. of that original sense of, of authority where you have to risk discerning what is true for you, and then to live it to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. and, and you also talk about asking larger questions and keeping them open and keeping them before us. And that you say answers tell us where we've been, but questions get us on our journey. And here in the second half of life, uh, in later life, we're still asking questions, right? We're not Sure. We don't have the answers and we're not, and you're not preaching answers. You're actually saying, keep asking the questions. Sure. Because again, whatever we conclude today, we're going to outgrow tomorrow or mm -hmm. the other circumstances are going to change anyhow. So again, it's, it's about recognizing that the questions of if childhood, like who's going to take care of me? How do I stay out of harm's way? Which are very legitimate questions. Mm -hmm. When they're d dominating in the later portions of our life, we're, we're, we're living at a child's level of expectation. Mm -hmm. The basic questions are, who am I really, apart from my roles and my history around me? Um, what is life asking of me? What is it I wish or need to bring into this world through me? Those are, those are different questions, and they have a developmental agenda because their answer is going to vary as our journey varies. Mm -hmm. Another section in that chapter is, and I don't want to give away the whole book. These are just the things that that I pulled out that um, that I'd love to hear your further thoughts on. You say that a common question you hear from new clients is, "Where do I start in this analytic journey?" And you say that that you usually respond with, "Start with your patterns," mm -hmm. and that is something that. I like to keep track of is uh, when something repeats, you know, what are my patterns? And so would you say a little bit more about why you recommend that? Sure, sure. We, we all have patterns and patterns are obviously uh, repeated behaviors. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why are we repeating them? Yeah. And in many cases, it's a learned behavior or these are complexes that are governing our, our decision process. And so none of us wakens in the morning and says to ourselves, well, today I'm going to do the same self-destructive and mm -hmm. stupid things I've done for a long time. But mm -hmm. there's a good chance that we will because of the reflexive power of these things. Uh, in other words, I couldn't overemphasize how much of our life is on automatic pilot. Yeah, We're responding to the stimuli around us. It activates our history. Our history's conditioned us to move in certain directions. And when we do that, reestablish and ratify those patterns, and they, they become very hard to break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also talk about symptoms. And, it, and you and I have discussed this before. In our culture, 
uh, things are geared toward getting rid of our symptoms, sure. right? Sure, sure. Well, from an, from an analytic standpoint, we yeah. almost have to welcome symptoms mm -hmm. because they are telling us of the autonomy of the human psyche, that if our patterns and our adaptations are working for us, we're not going to have symptoms because we're in accord with our inner world. But when we get out of line, the symptoms will start appearing. And, and this is a summons of the psyche to pay attention, to listen, which is, after all, what the word therapy means, to mm -hmm. listen or attend to, and to attend to the expression of the soul is what psychotherapy means from its etymology. So underneath all of that, we have to respect there's some intelligence in each of us that uh, when activated will respond. It's always speaking to us through the body, through the feeling function, through the energy systems and through our dreams, etc. So we have tons of clues as to how life is going as seen by the psyche, not by our success in adapting to the outer world. And in fact, the more I adapt to the outer world, the, the greater the symptomatology inside of me may have to ramp up because it's mm -hmm. uh, that very adaptation that may be protective at some level is also undermining something that is vital and useful intrapsychically. Another point that you make and you repeat it several times is that you say, remember that all the things you do are logical. Yes, yes, we don't do crazy things. We do logical things if you understand the cluster of your history that's been triggered. Mm -hmm. so we might realize that yesterday um, I, I was caught in an old pattern of, of codependence, a pattern of avoidance, yeah. a, a pattern of compliance or whatever the pattern may be. We may lament that, may regret it, but chances are giving the stimulus again, we're likely to repeat the pattern. So it takes a certain amount of suffering or, or consequences or sudden awareness for us to stand up against those reflexive responses and to step into a different kind of response that's more apropos to the reality of that situation, the reality of who you are as an adult. Mm -hmm. The next chapter, chapter two, when things fall apart in the midlife transit. Mm -hmm. And you say that in that chapter, you're gonna consider why sometimes things fall apart when our presumed center cannot hold. Mm -hmm. And I've been experiencing that lately where I feel like my, my center, my core is just not strong enough and can't hold it. And of course, here I am. I mean, it, it has, but that was a great reminder of what to focus on. I mean, that, that center, that still point that, and the self, which I wanted to mention earlier. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Well, look, we're, we're all in service to agendas, some of which we're of which we're conscious and some are not. And when we're serving agendas that are uh, inconsistent with our own psychological reality, again, there's going to be discord within. There's going mm -hmm. to be an eruption from below sooner or later. And whatever our adaptations were for the past, they're not necessarily applicable to the present moment. Mm -hmm. Things fall apart because they're supposed to. That's how we grow and develop. Mm. One might say, and this is not an original idea from me, is when we reach those points where no matter what we do, it's costly. That's the next stage of our individuation process. Mm. In other words, the question that abides with us always is how am I to live my life now in the face of the circumstances over which perhaps I have no control? Mm -hmm. You know, that's one reason why things like loss of partner or aging or illness or something like that. All of these things are notable occasions where the, the autonomy of life, you know, overwhelms our plans. You know, there was an old saying, man proposes and God disposes. In other words, you can have your mm -hmm. expectations, but then life is going to bring about something else. And so one, one has to go back to the drawing board repeatedly. And, and this is how yeah. we there are various passages in our lives and some are large and some are rather small and they may pass unconsciously, but they're occurring. And a passage occurs when something has played out. It's, it's no longer serving, it's no longer effective. Um, and then there's that difficult in between. And that's when people sometimes come into therapy wanting to fix it quickly, rather than ask, why is it come? What is it asking mm -hmm. of me? 
And what is the developmental agenda that I'm going to need to be facing in examining this? In this chapter, you also bring up uh, something that's of great interest to me right now, which is fate and destiny. And you write about the difference between fate and destiny. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. We tend to confuse the two of them in contemporary yeah. uh, culture. Uh, fate represents the, the, the givens. Um, you didn't choose your family of origin. You didn't mm -hmm. choose your genetic heritage. You didn't choose the time and place in history and all of the cultural forces that were influential in forming your sense of the provisional sense of self, plus your marching orders, how you were to comport yourself in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So when, when we look at that, then, then we realize, right, there, there is something else that is seeking to emerge here. And, and what is it? And, and that's the natural self. That's your natural, you know, capacity, interest, talents, and so forth, which may or may not fit with that external world. So um, then you have a, a conflict. And destiny is that which is seeking expression through us. Mm. That's the key. In other words, what is wanting to become through your life? And it doesn't have to be some huge achievement out there. We're not talking about public acclaim. We're talking mm. about just becoming more fully who you are, owning your values, owning your desires, owning your particular talents and interests and enthusiasms. And in doing that, you, 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 you serve the world by you know, bringing something new and different to it. That yeah. brings your chip to the larger mosaic of which we are only a tiny part. Something else in this chapter, I have to tell you, uh, blew up on Twitter. So I have been doing this since the beginning. I like to use Twitter to post quotes from whatever I'm currently reading. And I started doing that before I even started this podcast. Well, you have a section in chapter two uh, on projection. And you have written the five stages of projection. Mm -hmm. And because I have a, it's not important, a verified Twitter account, I can tweet long passages. And I tweeted that section and it got over 10,000 views um, and lots of comments like this is the best explanation or description uh, of projection that they had ever seen. So I want to thank you for that because it makes it a lot clearer what is projection. So I don't know if you wanted to say a little bit about. Well, sure, sure. Projection uh, is an autonomous process. In other words, we don't know that it's happened. I don't say, well, I'm going to have a projection on you by 10 o'clock today. A projection is when something has been activated and I respond with a, a, a psychological profusion of energy granted to you or to the other at mm -hmm. the given moment. And I, and I want to add, by the way, that that description of the five stages really comes from one of my teachers, Marie-Louise von Franz. Okay. And it, 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 the first stage is it's unconscious. I put something out on the other person, onto you. And um, I don't know that I've done that. So I'm seeing you, not as you are, but through the lens of my own expectations, my history, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, because the you are an other, in time you begin to sort of abrade that projection and it begins to wear away, which mm -hmm. is the third stage, which is some confusion or disorientation. In other words, you're not living up to the expectations of, of the uh, projection. So you see in relations, people say, well, you know, you change. You're not quite the person I thought you were. Yeah. This is new or how are you, what about this? And the fourth stage is the, erosion of the projection that falls back. That's how people fall out of love or they lose enthusiasm for something. Mm -hmm. And often it's left at that point. Whereas in fact, that fourth stage is an invitation to say mm -hmm. the energy I put out on you or that situation or whatever has eroded and now has come back to me. How am I going to use that in a more conscious way? Since I now understand I have a different approach to reality based on my experience. And, and the fifth stage, of course, is to make that conscious and to own that energy. As, I, as we were talking before, as tiny little dots, we necessarily transfer our authority to those giants who are walking around us because mm -hmm. we assume 
that they know what's going on in this world. Only oh, later do we realize they don't, that the adults are just as confused as the children. But, um, you know, that's, that's when that energy has come back to you. And the question always is now, how are you going to use it in a, a more considered way? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I, I recommend uh, everybody have a look at that section in chapter two. And the next chapter is on the shadow, chapter three. And I was actually tempted to ask you to j just do this episode about just this chapter and then do another episode about the whole book because chapter three shadow encounters in personal and public life is fantastic uh, uh let's just dive right in um i appreciate how you make the point in a couple places about how jung's concept of the shadow is often mistaken as being about evil and darkness. And that is not what it's about. Mm -hmm. Now, the shadow is one of Jung's richest concepts, and it, it involves those aspects of ourselves or of our affiliations, like a, a religious group or a political group, that when we make it conscious, we find troubling, perhaps contrary to our intentions mm -hmm. um, and or challenging in some way. So on the one hand, the darker sides of the human personality, in other words, none of us wishes to acknowledge that we're really petty at times, or we're jealous at times, or we're vindictive at times, or we're manipulative at times, but that's part of the shadow of every human being. That's part of being a human, and, and you need to own it, because if you don't, it's happening anyhow, and it's doing its, mm -hmm. its damage, perhaps. Yeah. The other aspect of it, though, Jung considered our greatest shadow issue was that we live lives that were too small for us, mm -hmm. that we haven't risked stepping into our own journey and, and serving what wishes to, to be expressed through us. And so the intimidation by the magnitude of that project keeps us all comfortable, safe, avoidant. And then progressively, of course, the cost of which is we become strangers to ourselves. And if I'm a stranger to myself, then I'm not going to be very good in any relationship to another person. You point out that the shadow is often formed as a result of our defenses against what brings us anxiety. I sure. thought that was really well put and it really made me think about. Sure. Every defense, and we, we have tons of them and we need to, um, is in direct proportion to whatever exposure we had to perceived or actual threats. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest shadow issues, of course, is how much of our daily life is governed by fear-based responses, where we keep our mouth shut or we mm -hmm. avoid certain subjects or people or whatever the issues may be. And, you know, that's not a federal crime, but it's also sad that the fears that are often learned in childhood, where almost everything is overwhelming, um, become so influential in a person's life later. Mm -hmm. So with all of that, you know, you, you begin to realize to be who you are is going to require some courage. It's going to re require some decisions in your life. It's going to require you taking steps in your life. And when you do that, you may find yourself pretty much alone. You may or may not find the support that you want. But all right, then weigh the cost of not doing that because the cost is significant as well. Because underneath all of that is the question, otherwise, am I living in any sort of authentic way with myself, with others, with my career, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, in the interest of time, I want to bring up something that I, I attended your lecture when you were here in Chicago in 2014. And I remember very specifically you bringing up a story that you relate in the book about how when you released a book, you didn't say which book it was, uh, your publicist or the, the publisher had you do all these radio interviews. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you did, I think, 40 or something mm -hmm. in, in a short span of time. And in 30 out of the 40 interviews, you were asked about a couple of stories that were in the news. Mm -hmm. And when you, when I heard you speak uh, here in Chicago, you brought up um, 
one you you mentioned two in the book, but you brought up the one about a very famous pop singer mm -hmm. uh, shaved her hair off, mm -hmm. and that that's really what people wanted to talk about. And I didn't understand what you were trying to say when oh. when when I saw you at the lecture. I didn't understand, and it bothered me. And I didn't. I didn't ask you a question. I did ask my analyst about it later, and I didn't even understand what, what she said. It was it came up in the book. I was so excited when when I saw you uh, bring it up in the book because now it makes sense to me. And I was wondering if you would just relate briefly the point you were trying to make because it. Mm -hmm. it I I had that same reaction that I didn't think she was crazy. I. I saw underneath that, so I'll, I'll let you you tell us. Sure. Well, the, as you as you said, it was more than one book where the uh, publisher set up f these forty radio interviews, and and m some of the people had read the book very seriously and asked very thoughtful questions. Others, it was just they skimmed it and so forth. But the subject was the shadow, and it was a very rich, rich uh, loam for us to dig into, and um, and yet. Of those 30 of the 40, people really wanted to talk about the latest gossip. Oh, you want to talk about the shadow? Let's talk about this person. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that person. And the two examples I mentioned were the pop star and the logic of her act, even though to the public it looked crazy, mm -hmm. was inwardly, you know, something inside that was wanting to break out of that glass bubble in which she's in prison. And the other one was was another you know public figure who did something for which she ultimately went to jail, but in other words, gossip was more interesting than examining what the shadow really means, and mm -hmm. that's the shadow issue. You know, as as Jesus said, "I can see the speck in your eye, but miss the log in my own." So this is not a new issue. So are we surprised that that gossip does, is available to distract us from examining the shadow in our own lives, and that? Mm -hmm the shadow issue itself mm -hmm. right there. right there so that is on page 53 of the book chapter four is titled the seven deadly sins through a psychological lens and i was wondering why you wrote about sin kind of in this day and age why sin mm -hmm. that's a good question uh, in in other words um what was sin as our ancestors saw it and generally speaking it had to do with not adhering to a, a set of prescribed values, behaviors, expectations, and so forth. And with a heavy sanction that, uh, that rises out of our violation of those values. Um, and, and it's useful to say, since our ancestors were looking at the same human condition we're looking at, mm. what was their insight? And they often recognized that, you know, certain behaviors led to some negative outcomes. And so one has to be mindful of that. But looking at this through a psychological uh, lens, we, we can see these dimensions still are at work in the human psyche. And if you don't use the language of history about sin and salvation and so forth, you still have to account for what happens when greed takes over in our lives, for example, or we're dominated by anger and so forth. You know, these these are states of possession and, and you mm. describe those possessions as being owned temporarily, at least, by a complex. So um, we, we need, we may use a different language, but we're describing the same human topography. So it's, it's useful to look at the traditional uh, perspectives as a way of uh, illumining the universality, really, of, of our human condition. And, and toward the end of that chapter, you bring up the concept of the hero and the heroine. And I, I like what you wrote here. You said uh, it's tasked with overthrowing the darkness, the darkness of fear, the darkness of sloth. Mm -hmm. That's what the hero is tasked with. Yes, yes. The, the hero archetype, as Jung described it, is really that energy in us that gets us out of bed in the morning, that takes us into life, that helps us face our fears and move through them. Um, and Ultimately, we have to realize that the greatest enemies we'll ever have to face are inside of us. It's our fear based on, again, the legacy of being small in a big world, and that is the intimidation of the large other. And secondly, our desire to go back asleep, to stay, yeah. to stay child, childish. 
to find somebody to take care of us, to find somebody to tell us what the world's about and what our marching orders might be. You know, that's inside of all of us. And when it prevails, it infantilizes the individual and abrogates their journey towards personality or personhood. Um, and, and so for each of us, you know, the summons ultimately is step into your life journey. When, when Jung said we all walk in shoes too small for us, what he was saying was we stay stuck in our adaptations and our avoidant behaviors. And on the one hand, that's understandable. But also when you become conscious of it, it's no longer acceptable because mm -hmm. it means I'm being governed by fear. I'm being governed by the childhood dependency. And, and again, I, as a human being, have to step into my life and make it real for me. Whenever I hear you say that, I think of how I embodied that literally. I used to wear uh, the wrong size shoes. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in analysis, I remember bringing in a dream that I was wearing shoes that were too tight. And now I just, now I wear the correct size shoes. So just think of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the next chapter, chapter five is titled Dispelling the Ghosts Who Run Our Lives, which is the subtitle of your book, Hauntings. Mm -hmm. And you say that we have to remember what is not conscious may often still be present. Of course, what is present but not conscious is especially powerfully influential influential in our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, to use the, the metaphor of hauntings was really to talk about, once again, the power of complexes. That is to say, and when you hear the word complex, don't hear something negative. A complex is simply a, a cluster of energy Mm -hmm. uh, that life has given us. And we have some positive complexes through bonding with parents or others that allow us to care for others, to, to love others. Um, we also have some basic fears that were given to us by life. You know, every infant sooner or later has to touch that iron and find mm -hmm. out it really is hot and you mm -hmm. stay away from it and you avoid it under these circumstances. Now, if that then later affects your behavior in a negative way, you started avoiding all shiny objects or you were afraid to do your ironing or whatever the case may be, then you realize the complex now owns you. As, as Jung said, there's a big difference between saying I have a complex, which is to say I have history, and, and saying, on the other hand, the complex has me. Mm -hmm. Because when they rise, they, <clears throat> they have the capacity to take over the ego and we serve its, its old agenda. That's how we that's how we create those patterns we were referencing before. You know, I don't say, well, I'm going to be doing these avoidant things today, but I will have various behaviors that have a life of their own. And that's that uh, reflexive life that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's what you mean by what is not conscious may still often be present. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and really is a governing system. A governing system. In that chapter, you also mention Jung's view of his ancestors and that he concluded that he had inherited the unfinished business of his ancestors. Inherited. Yes. Well, to some degree, I mean, you know, the great wisdom traditions have often taked about, talked about the uh, transmission of issues through the generations and at least through three generations, which is as far back as we can normally see. Three. And okay. when, when we look at that, we, we, we realize that whatever our models of reality are that were given to us or which we witnessed for ourselves become defining frames. But what if that frame doesn't allow you to grow and develop? Mm. I mean, I look back on my early childhood school teachers, and I look back on the local librarian as heroes in my life because something inside of me knew, although I couldn't have articulated this, that life at home was too constricted, too governed by rules and fears. And so as I used to read the biographies of people just mm -hmm. because I was hungry to see how other people coped, yeah. how they left home or how they saw the world. And so without knowing what I was doing, there, there was the germ of a journey, if you will, forming within. 
And when it came time to leave, I did leave. My parents were always expecting me to stay there and help take care of them as they take care of me, et cetera. It was supposed to be a mutual security pact, which I understand. I don't judge at all. I also know it was stifling. Yeah. Not allowed the the journey that was life was asking of me. Mm. So, you know, when, when you have a large example, in most cases, it's replicated into the next generation or the person spending their life trying to get away from it to say anything but that. Uh, or thirdly, they're out there trying to treat it, to solve it in some unconscious way, a life of distraction, a life of busyness, a life of self-narcosis, um, a life of busyness. Or if you're really troubled, you can become a therapist like me and work with other people with that mm-hmm. problem. See, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. would be a joke, but yeah. there's truth to it as well. Right. So... We inherit the unfinished business of our ancestors. We are burdened with the unlived life of our parents. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? (laughs) What You live your life just as fully as you can by by the lights that make sense to you. I'm not talking about narcissism. I'm Mm -hmm. not talking about self-absorption. Um, I, in no way is this selfish. It's, it, it's great. It's a great task. It's, it's a struggle. Yeah, but it's ultimately your gift to others. You you bring a more evolved person to your partner, to your children, to your world, and that more evolved person is is your gift. And it doesn't have to be in that in some external flashy way. Just becoming who you are is the most difficult of all things. Yeah, and living that identity and living those values and 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 those enthusiasms in your life is is what you bring to the table of life. And there again, you, you, your chip to the great mosaic is your, your personality. You, Jung said, when we undertake our own journey, you incur a certain debt. And that debt is repaid by returning to the collective, to the family, to the relation as that more evolved person. And that's how society grows. And that's how uh, ultimately children can outlast the constrictions of, of their uh, history lessons. Mm-hmm. The next chapter, chapter six, is titled Finding Personal Resilience in Times of Change. And in this, you you mentioned the loss of the numinous. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me uh, because what happens, I'm looking for it here. Oh, here. Absent a sense of connection to something numinous, you say, we have to create disturbances. And you were, that was from Jung's uh, 1939 Uh, speech in London, The Symbolic Life, absent a sense of connection to something numinous, we have to create disturbances. Would you say a little bit about that? Sure. Well, again, something inside of us uh, knows what's right for us. Mm -hmm. And whenever we violate that or have it violated by the circumstances of our outer life, something inside is going to register that. And sooner or later, our ignoring of those registrations will ramp up to the point that they become unavoidable. And it's only at that point do we usually get pushed into something. Uh, I was privileged at midlife having achieved everything that I thought was important for me um, with a depression. And I was astonished to ask the question, why when I have this life that is acceptable and and, and desirable in front of me, why is it that I'm experiencing this depression? And that's what sent me to my first hour of analysis many years ago in my 30s. And and I realized there's a whole world that's pressed down. When you have a depression, rather than just say, how quickly do I get rid of it? We have to say, why has the psyche autonomously withdrawn its approval and support mm-hmm. from the places where the ego consciousness is investing its energies? Little did I know I was starting the second half of life. Little did I know I was going to migrate essentially from America to Switzerland. Little did I know that um, I was going to change my profession and so forth. Those were the developmental issues that came up along the way. And and yet I realize now there was a larger life, and I'm talking psychologically, not Mm -hmm. politically, a larger life that was being uh, summoned at that point and and the depression was psyche's way of grabbing me and and saying let's pay some attention here in this chapter you also uh provide a list of questions 
uh, suggestions for us to ask ourselves every day. And I'll, I'll leave that to the reader to find in the book. And also, that well, that's followed by a section on active imagination. And you say that that is activating the image. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that maybe that deserves a little uh, description. Uh, if you would uh, tell us about Jung's concept of active imagination and how you use that as an analyst mm -hmm. uh, in your work. Sure. Let, let's just give an example and say you have a dream and you're in a house, maybe your house, someone else's, and there's some sinister figure there that you feel threatened by. Well, the natural thing uh, for the ego to do is get out of the house, pay mm -hmm. no attention, distance yourself as much as you can. But in active imagination, we, we try to re-enter the psychological space of that dream and activate that image and, and go and interrogate or in question that sinister figure. The last thing you would consciously want to do is exactly what is asked here to mm. talk to that figure. Why are you hostile to me? What is this about? What do you want from me? And, and you realize that maybe it's not so hostile after all. It's really some part of yourself that you've disowned and simply wanting your recognition or wanting your integration into your life. So, um, you know, I've frequently mentioned the first dream I ever had in, in Zurich as, as I was beginning in the midst of that depression it was that I was a knight on the walls of a castle that was under siege. And at the edge of the forest, I could see that there was a witch-like figure who was directing the assault on the castle. And the dream ended with a high degree of anxiety. Will this castle hold? And it seemed very dubious that it would. And my analyst said, we're going to have to lower the drawbridge and go out and talk to her and see why she's so irritated at you. And I remember at the time thinking, are you crazy? She's trying to kill me. Right? The dream was so threatening. It was like, she's trying to kill me. And then I thought, look, I'm in, I'm in Zurich. I've in for a penny, in for a pound. I've come this far. Why not? So we, we, we went through this exercise of reentering the dream, lowering the drawbridge, going out to meet her. And at which point? she began to motion me into the forest and ultimately opened this large book of symbols in the forest that was uh, beginning of a journey. I can tell you from a, this remove, it sounds just, you know, archaeologically interesting, but at the time it was very frightening. Yeah. It was saying, you know, the things that have frightened you or the things that have governed you are in some way now the things you have to confront. And when you mm -hmm. do, you'll find you have resources within you. Uh, and that's what that chapter on resilience is. We are equipped to live this journey. Our ancestors found that in many cases, not all cases. We have it within me, within ourselves. It's, it's part of our DNA, but you have to risk it. You have to draw upon it. And, and Jung said something once that I think about almost every hour, and that is, he said, what supports you when nothing supports you? And, and I think that's a central question because the truth is when we lose the outer points of reference, whether it's our own health or a partner or a structure that we were counting on, um, then we have to draw upon a strength that is there within each of us. Something rises to the occasion and, and serves to continue the journey. Now, if we don't give ourselves to that resilience, of course, we'll stay stuck in loss, in uh, fear, in patterns of avoidance. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to think about that a lot. I've, I've heard you mention that before, and, and thank you for, uh, mm -hmm. for reminding me. So we've got two more chapters. Chapter seven is titled Reviewing the Journey. And it's where you bring up uh, what you tell yourself every morning uh, when you're going out to your car. And what are those six words? Yes, well, I have a de facto motto um, as, as I go to the car. Um, shut up, suit up, show up. Um, shut up is my reminder to myself. I don't say it to others, to myself. <laughs> Um, look, your problems are minimal compared to the world. Many people are dying as we speak. People are in intractable pain. People's children are, are in peril. What, what do you have to complain about? So shut up, you know, you know, pull up your socks, move on. 
Secondly, um, you know, suit up means prepare, do your homework, do what you need to do to prepare. Don't expect life to just walk up and hand itself to you. Maybe you have to fight for something. So do, do the necessary labor. And thirdly, just show up as best you can. We, we all carry internalized standards that we think we have to achieve to have, quote, be successful or win somebody's approval or someone's affection. And in, in the end, you, you know, you're here to serve the soul ultimately. And, and you simply do the best you can. It's not about winning or losing. That's a silly, you know, bifurcated, bifurcated game. Mm. It's more about was this journey yours or were you living someone else's? That's mm. a different kind of question. And if it was your journey, no matter what its outcome, uh, you, you will have served life and the powers that brought us here in the first place. You know, many of the people that we would most admire were people who had lives of enormous suffering, perhaps even martyrdom. But we admire them because they somehow adhered to a core value that mattered deeply to them. And in doing so, they, they were the embodiment of the journey itself and the bringer of the value. And that's part of that heroic task is to bring mm -hmm. back to the tribe, to the collective, some new value or, or, or some newly endorsed value that's compensatory to, you know, the collective values that are governing at the moment. And we're really hard on our, the people that we hold up that, that they, they're still flawed. And I wrote here in my notes, uh, I wrote important in all caps, you wrote, as I found in workshops through the years in various cities and certainly working with patients, these issues don't go away. There are still developmental tasks for each of us, still parts of us that are infantile, that flee responsibility and flee accountability, and that try to ignore the genuine conflict that competing values represent in our lives. So these issues do not go away. We learn to manage them. They get smaller, but we're still dealing, right? Sure. Well, the core issues of our life will always be with us because you're not absent your history. You carry it intrapsychically. Everything that's happened has been neurologically recorded and it'll show up in dreams and unconscious behaviors. Um, but this is why Jung said we don't solve these problems, but we can outgrow them. Mm -hmm. to say, you know, now what I was giving as an illustration before the fears of the family, the fears of childhood will always stay somewhere within us. And, and yet, are they the governing principles for mm -hmm. your life? Can you, can you stand up against them? You, you might be afraid of conflict, for example, but it's important to assert your values if you're going to be a person who's consistent with those values. Or sometimes you have to be willing to risk uh, a security, a past security, because something larger is calling to you and, and you let go of this and step into the unknown. And in doing that, again, something will carry you through. But when you're doing it, you might be very frightened. But in time, you learn to outgrow that. And when you outgrow that, um, you know, you're not governed by it. It's still present. Don't assume ever that it's gone. Just assume that it could come up in a new way, in a new disguise, in a different setting which is why we have to be mindful of our basic patterns of avoidance or accommodation or whatever the case may be. And another theme that, uh, that runs throughout the book is that you say something in us knows always mm -hmm. that we may not wish to know the answer. We may flee the answer, but we still know the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's that, the right. That's going back to what we were talking about earlier. So, is it about having the strength and the courage to mm -hmm. say, I know what it is? Sure, because you're right. Something in us knows what's right and something in us knows where we're stuck and where we're blocked. And we can deny it. We can rationalize it a thousand ways. But something in us knows. And that's what Sartre called living in mauvais foi, bad faith. So uh, sooner or later, we are summoned to challenge our own you know, behavioral responses and ask, is, is this you know, living the fullest life I can? 
uh, what do I need to do to step into the next stage of my journey? Or, or another way of putting this is what is life asking of me now in the face of the circumstances over which I have no control or very little control, let's say. So sooner or later, you know, the great enemy always is fear. That's why Jung said that our domination by fear is really the negation of the life force itself and that it happens so often. And that's part of the human condition. But sooner or later, if you're going to grow up, you have to deal with the fears, not necessarily conquer them, but live as fully as you can in the face of them. That's courage. In a, in a letter Jung wrote in the 1950s, he said, the work of personal growth and development consists of three parts of which psychology can only help with the first part, and that's to give insight. Let us understand what it is we're struggling with. He said, then come the moral qualities of the individual. Second is courage to face what must be faced. And third is endurance, persistence, sticking it out over time. And that's how you outgrow some of these childhood uh, behavioral patterns. Mm -hmm. The last chapter is chapter eight titled living more fully in the presence of mortality mm -hmm. and in this chapter uh I, I always mention this i mention this i think on every episode we do together because i notice this in every single one of your books you reference freud and i appreciate that very much and there's lots on freud in this chapter would you tell us a little bit about what you take from him well, I think, you know, as, as much as the Jungian might differ with a Freudian perspective, there's so much we learn from it. Yeah. And so many of the basic concepts, such as resistance and transference and counter-transference and, um, you know, working with dreams and, and other approaches to the psyche, we, we learn from Freud. So we need to give him proper credit there. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of us would differ with his interpretations or some of his methods and attitudes, but, you know, that's going to happen. Yeah. But we have to recognize that this was one of the pioneers to sort of explore the unconscious. And, of course, the problem with the unconscious is it's unconscious, so we don't know very much about it. So that's quite a voyage to undertake. And even if you've reached some wrong conclusions along the way, you, you still have taken a journey that was a journey of discovery from which we all profit. Mm -hmm. So in, in the chapter, you talk about mortality and mm -hmm. end of life. And actually, I think what I want to say was in the chapter previous, uh, you give an example of one of your patients who had a terminal illness and she knew that she didn't have much longer to live. And she spent the final, I don't know if it was months of her life mm -hmm. skydiving Yes. and practicing martial arts and and that and that she had said that that was the best time of her life yes well that was uh, an individual for whom i have the greatest of respect um who came with uh, less than a year to live and early on we discovered the power that her fears had played in her life mm -hmm. she was afraid of everyone and of everything mm -hmm. and then she realized in a very deep and abiding way you know i'm dying what do I have to fear? I might mm -hmm. as well grab the life that I have here. And, and she did. Now, that doesn't mean it's a recommendation for other people to take up skydiving and martial arts. Sure. It's just for her, that's the last thing she would have ever done with her life. But it was symbolic of taking on her journey. What, what I didn't discuss there, because it was more involved, but that also involved the repair of a lot of relationships that had been broken in her mm -hmm. life, too where she was still being stuck by her fears and, and the patterns of avoidance. See, her, her chief um, st strategy for survival was avoiding. Well, that's reasonable and understandable, but, you know, how far does avoidance take you in life? Sooner or later, you have to turn and move into something in order to grow and develop. And, and this is what did it for her. And, and she did say in such a memorable way, I wish that this had come to me, this insight, this invitation earlier and in a different form in my life. But uh, this has been the best time of my life because this is the time where I was least governed by childhood fears. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true for all of us. For her, it was just very pronounced because of the imminence of mortality. Because you see, it's, it's mortality that makes this life meaningful. That's the paradox of that chapter and about our lives. 
if I were immortal, I'd just repeat myself for a few centuries and then do something else for a few centuries. Nothing would matter. No choices would matter. No consequences would pile up. Um, instead, because we're mortal, we realize this is a short and precious life. What now are you going to do with it? You see, that's, that's the key. And it's that which makes life meaningful. My choices matter because they do govern the, the outcomes and, and the investments of energy that I live in this particular life. If there's another life, then it's another life. This is the one we know we have. And so it's, it's a summons to, again, step into the largeness of your journey, minus some of those old avoidances and defenses that were once so necessary and so domineering. That's a really beautiful way to end this. Um, would you like to end it there? I, I, again, want to thank you for a wonderful interview. It's always great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollis. It was great to see you. We'll see you again. Good to see you. Please visit the website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything discussed in this episode and to access all of our previous episodes available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Jung is also available on YouTube podcasts, which you can access by subscribing to our channel, Jungian and Laura. It's free. Just click the subscribe button below. This podcast is made possible by the revolutionary new dream recording app, Temenos Dream. Discover the hidden meaning of your dreams using symbolism, literature, and mythology. Use the built-in AI illustrator and share your dreams with others, all within the app. Download it by clicking on the link on the episode page or in the description box below and create a free account today. I created Speaking of Jung over eight years ago as a free podcast. All of our content is still free to access, but it is not free to produce. Please visit the support page on our website at speakingofjung.com support to help keep this podcast alive. Thank you to our recurring donors, John Temple, Ralph Gotzelman, Eric Hoops, Doreen Gordon, Mark Johnson, and Brian McMichael for their ongoing generosity and support. With special thanks to Ivory Fields It Sounds True, I'm Laura London, and you've been watching a very special video edition of Speaking of Young.